our thoughts matter. The mindset that we have day in, day out, it matters. It makes a difference. And we're looking at this section here in Colossians, and, and I feel that, that a good title for this is that we need to be focused and functional. We've, we've seen this week after week. And as we consider today, we're looking at the fact that our work matters to God. We're going to try to see how our work matters to God. And as I say that, I, I have a host of illustrations that I could use. It depends on time. It depends on really how God's Spirit leads through these moments. But I'm mindful that when I look at this whole passage or this, whole, this, this title and this idea, mindful of two different things right here at the outset. Number one, I, I was like 10 years old when I got my first job. And it was a job on a farm and I was working for my Uncle Neil. He paid me all of 40 cents an hour. And I remember that first paycheck I got from a week's work. And yes, I worked 40 hours. I got $16. And I remember how I, I, I got that check. And my, I said to my dad, you know, I, I'm gonna, I was saving for something that I wanted. And he looked at me very seriously and he says, well, what about God's portion? I'll never forget that. And that had an impression on me. And, and, and that, that struck me that you know I'm working, yes. I'm earning, yes. But it's for God's glory. It's, it, there, there, God has a, a purpose in all of that. And then the second thing that comes to mind is, is I, I taught a, a three-hour class for Moody on two different occasions and the textbook for the class was a book entitled, Your Work Matters to God. And the subtitle was, A Theology of Work. And I dare say that most of us don't stop and think about the fact that there is a theology to what we do for a living. And God uses that stuff, God wants to use that stuff in such a way that, that there's... There's eternal purpose in that. And I say that just as, as, as an introductory type comment. And as we consider where we've been, I, I'm going to be very brief with this this morning, the series of truths addressed in Colossians 3 and 4, and I'm being brief because I want us to be able to crystallize these thoughts. I want us to be able to see these. The series of, of truths would be that there's an emphasis on the impact and the influence of what God does. The impact and the influence of God's presence in our lives. His Holy Spirit indwells our lives and that should show. It should show in the way that we sing on Sunday's mornings. It should show in the way in which we receive a message on Sunday mornings. It should show in the way in which we do the things that are routines in our schedule day in and day out through the week. And we've seen that in looking at family. We've looked at the whole issue of how we put off certain sins of affection or sins of attitude and all that. And therefore, there's an emphasis on the impact and influence of God's presence in our lives. He's with us. Secondly, the provision that we have for salvation. A couple weeks ago, we celebrated the Lord's table. Had comments from several people that said, you know what, let's do what we did that Sunday for the whole service sometime. Because we placed a strong emphasis, a stronger emphasis than what we normally do on the, the reality of what it meant that Christ paid the price for our sins. And I, I can't speak for anyone else here, and I don't say this in any way to, to put myself in the center, but I know as we sing certain songs, as we get to the second verse of in Christ alone, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness, you know, and, and, and all of that, and, and we get to that, and I can't help but it's emotional. It strikes me. Why me? Why did He die for me? And there should be some sense of, 
of impact and influence on the fact that His provision is sufficient to pay the price for all of our wrongdoing. And that's not an excuse for us to go out and live like, boy, I'm going to do everything I can because I got grace. No, that's an excuse to say, I'm going to live and serve Him. I'm going to honor Him. So the provision for salvation. Thirdly, the idea of God's promises. He's promised. He's promised that heaven is waiting for us. He's promised that He would be with us through thick and thin. He's made an abundance of promises. And then finally, the idea of His perfecting grace. His presence, His provision for salvation, His promises say, He's going to perfect me. He's going to change me. He's going to make me different. So we come to what I say here is a relevant reality that I, I need to accept. We've seen this over the last few weeks when we looked at the idea of husbands and wives. We looked at parents and children. And we looked at fathers. We're going to jump farther into that whole concept today as we look at workers. But my dealings with other people, how I respond to folks, how I react to certain situations, how I listen or fail to listen, all those dealings with other people are an important indication of my relationship with Christ. When someone snaps at you, you should stop and realize if that person claims to be a Christian, that means there's something going on. When I snap at someone else, oh heaven forbid that I do, but I do, means there's something going on. And that's a relevant reality that we need to accept in our lives that the way we deal with people is that important indication of the intimacy of our relationship with Christ. I added an I word in there. Now, we get to this section in Colossians 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, and the reality is our work matters. It has to do with our dealings with people. It has to do with our relationship with Christ. And we see here that my relationship with the Lord it should impact my efforts and my ethics. My efforts and my ethics in the work that I do. And we're going to define work here today and we're going to go far beyond the idea of employment. Because I think Paul goes beyond that in this passage. When we look at the, the cultural circumstances that were there, he went far beyond the idea of simply working for someone and earning a pay. And my relationship with the Lord should impact the whole issue of the effort that I make and the ethics that I have in the work that I do or in the effort in, in, in all that I do. And to make another statement here, my work matters to God. Why? Because the work I do is a gift from Him. The abilities He gives. It's a gift. And ultimately... My work brings glory, honor, and praise to Him. And I don't have a slide for this. I don't have a, a, something to, to, to point to when I say this, but I, I want to get you thinking a little bit. Ask yourself, how much does the work that I do bring honor, glory, and praise to God the Father? How much does it do that? And as we consider that thought, here's an essential truth that I want all of us to understand. This is a key area of presentation that Paul makes in this passage where he says, if I claim to be a faithful follower of Christ, if I say that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, And understand, I am always, every moment, every day. And as I say this right now, it, it, I shudder at the reality that, oh boy, have I ever blown it sometimes. But every moment of every day, I am always accountable to Him. I'm always accountable to Jesus Christ. 
And I want us to get that thought and I ask the questions here. Who's in charge? Who's in, who has control? And a simple question that all of us need to at least pause for a second and say yes or maybe or no. Is Jesus my Lord and Savior? Or my Savior and Lord? And I think those two concepts, the idea of Him being our Savior and being Lord, they go together. They cannot be separated. And we ask that question because that's, that's part of how we tie together the idea of faithful followers of Christ are accountable to Him. So we go on and we see this passage of Scripture. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. We'll see it on the screen in just a minute, but I ask the question as we consider that, how does my faith intersect with my work? When I'm on the job, how does my faith have an impact on what I'm doing? When I'm volunteering for some organization or for the church, how does my faith affect what I'm doing? Am I doing this all on my own strength and on my own ability? Or am I saying, God, I need you every hour? So we look at the passage. It's supposed to be. Well, somebody told me it looks a little bit like a, an employee handbook. It was the best I could do with the one dimensional graphic that I had. But at any rate, the passage reads and says I'm going to read from the screen. It's bigger than my notes are right now. Employees in all things. Or to see what the passage itself, it says, slaves in all things. We'll define that in a few moments. Slaves, employees in all things, obey those who are your supervisors, who are your masters on earth. Not with external service, as those who merely please men, but rather with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. That's countercultural right there. We go on reading, and he says, Realize that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Therefore, in reality, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For everyone who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without any partiality. And then he concludes with a statement, chapter 4, verse 1, where he says, okay, masters, employers, bosses, grant to your workers justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master who is in heaven. That's our passage. And as we take a moment, just a second or two, I want to bridge the gap, the cultural gap from Paul's society to our society. Because some people may read this passage and say, we don't have slaves, we're not slaves. And, and that's, that's a true statement. And in fact, slavery through history has gone through a host of changes. But let's not be foolish and say that slavery in that day and age was easy, because it wasn't. So we ask two brief questions. Why did Paul seem to accept slavery? Once again, let me say, you don't have room on the notes. You can write down what you want to write down, but I will give anybody that wants these notes to you. We'll make copies and get them to you. Why did Paul seem to accept slavery? Well, first off, let's realize he never condoned it, nor did he condemn it. Neither one. Jesus never condoned slavery. He never condemned slavery. Secondly, we see that historically speaking, 
there were approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. 60 million. They say that probably over half the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. Over half the population. Thirdly, we see that 90 to 95 percent of the work was done by slaves. Those that owned the slaves didn't do much. Thirdly, we see that Paul's message to those who were followers of Christ was contrary to the cultural norms. He was countercultural. He said things that the government leaders wouldn't have liked or didn't like. He said, thing that the, said things that the slave owners didn't like. He said things that the slaves didn't like. And finally, Paul's focus was always. I think most every word that Paul wrote was focused or centered on the gospel of Christ. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, we do all things for the sake of the gospel. And I think that the church today should recognize that we do all things for the sake of the gospel. Therefore, the gospel should be right at the center of where we live. But we see that as the first question. Secondly, is there any appropriate link between then and now? How do we look at those slaves and those masters and relate to that? Well, very simply, one statement based on Paul's analysis based on what Paul says throughout his writings, especially here in this passage, slaves and masters in his culture and society would have a very similar relationship to the role of employees and employees in ours. He didn't get involved in the political issue of whether slavery was right or wrong. He just spoke truth and said, okay, if you're working for somebody, whether it be as an employee or as a slave, and that somebody is your supervisor, there's a certain aspect of impact and influence that should happen if you're a follower of Christ. There should be a difference in what you do. So we can say when Paul says to the slaves, do this, do that, he's talking to those of us that work for a living. When he talks to the masters, he's talking to those of us that supervise people as part of our role. So I think it's very simple in that regard. But now, as we go into the, the intersection between faith and work, how do they collide, so to speak? Is there a collision there or is there a, gain, a, a growing together of faith and work? And I'm not talking about theology in we work for our salvation or we just trust God for salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the idea of our belief system in our value system in how we do what we do. So the intersection there between that, first off, I've got five things I want to point to. I want five things I want to consider as we look at this. First of all, I look at the task of servanthood. The task of servanthood. And we look at the passage and we see employees or slaves in all things obey your supervisors on earth. Not with external service as those who please men, but instead with sincerity of heart, respecting, reverencing, fearing the Lord. So what do we do first? We define the word servant. Can that mean anything but slave? Because that's really what the, the, the Greeks... When they heard that word, they saw it as slave, yes. But yet, the specific meaning, it means slave, whether voluntary or involuntary, either one. Secondly, it meant one who was devoted to the best interests of another. One who is devoted to the best interests of someone else, like an employee is supposed to be. Or thirdly, one who was dedicated to a specific task, role, or project. 
Or finally, one who was obligated by an agreement. An agreement to fulfill a set of responsibilities. And Paul says, we all have the task of servanthood. We all have some way in which we are responsible or accountable to someone else for the efforts that we make, for the things that we do. Now, going on one step farther, the word servant, who, who can be a servant? Any of us can be. Someone who is under obligation or contract? Yeah. Someone who is an employee? Yes. Someone who happens to be a paid worker? Servant. Someone who is an unpaid worker? Or an unpaid volunteer? Just going to comment and say that one of the biggest challenges that I think anyone involved in in community service projects or church projects or church ministry, one of the biggest challenges is, is how to respond to a volunteer. And there are books written on the subject. There are articles written on the subject. There are, there are webinars and seminars on it because keeping volunteers happy is a very hard thing to do. But yet, as I look at it from the perspective of what Paul says right here, and, and don't misunderstand, don't mis misread my words, but anyone who volunteers to be involved in a ministry in this place is a servant. There is an obligation involved. There's a role and a responsibility which must be fulfilled. And the good thing about it is, is we step beyond saying, okay, I'm responsible to the, the ministry team for this or the ministry team for that or the pastor or whatever else. No. As we're going to see in this passage, we're responsible to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we see that, and then, and then finally, we see that it's anyone who has a specific task, role, job, project, duty, or accountability to complete or fulfill. So the task of servanthood involves all of us, any of us. And therefore, as we look at the passage, we see, he says, in all things, obey your supervisors on earth. In all things, obey them. What's that mean? That means acknowledging and accepting my accountability to accomplish what is anticipated. It's far easier when we're getting a lucrative paycheck. I've got friends, I've got folks that I know that are involved in, in various part-time jobs or full-time jobs. I've got a friend who's a pastor in another community. And in order to, 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 to pay his bills, he's got three part-time jobs besides the church. And, you know, he's, he's inundated with that sense of, well, I've got so much to do and, and so many things to do and this and that. And the reality is, 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 he says here, in all things, obey your supervisors on earth. How many people do we have to obey? How many masters do we have to follow? How often do we have to acknowledge and accept the fact that we have an accountability to accomplish that which is anticipated? It's also recognizing and responding to what is required in my role. And therefore, the task of servanthood is not always easy. And we'll talk more about it as we go, but let's go on to the next idea. The next idea, in fact, illustration here. The temptation of shamming. Does anybody know what shamming is? Ginny, fellow Cub fan. All right. Well, 
I didn't know what it was until actually the year was 1973. I was a, well, I was a military man. I was serving our country in the army and I did my job with a sense, and, and I wish I could say I was doing it because of my relationship with Christ, but it wasn't. It was because of the work ethic where I grew up. But nonetheless, I was doing my job like crazy. And finally, one of the guys in the office at, down at Fort Knox came up to me and says, you know what? You need to do more shamming. Well, what, what's that? He says, well, you need to look busy and not be doing anything. And what? You need to look busy, but you don't have to be doing something. And it's funny because that year in the Kentucky Derby, that year, how many of you have, have followed the Kentucky Derby at all? Does the name Secretariat mean anything to you? Well, Secretariat won the Triple Crown that year and he won the Kentucky Derby, but the second place horse in the Derby that year, his name was Sham. And everybody in our office was cheering for Sham. Well, as I give that story, as I tell that thing, there's a temptation to look like you're busy, but not necessarily be accomplishing anything. And I look at the passage here and he says, Obey, not with external service, as those who please men, but rather with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men. Realize that, dot, 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 there's more in the passage. We'll look at that in a moment. It is Christ, the Lord Christ, whom you serve. Realize that. And when we look at the whole issue of shamming, as I said, it is to pretend to be doing something when you're actually not, when you're not actually doing. That you're not actually doing. I, I was saying it in my words rather than reading the screen. Forgive me. I'll say that again. To pretend to be doing something that you are not actually doing. That's shamming. Or, in fact, it's in the dictionary. Maybe not all the dictionaries, but I know it's in the dictionary because I looked it up. Is to prevent, or to present a false sense of reality. And I throw a little thought down at the bottom of the screen. When the boss is looking, everyone appears to be doing their job. True statement? Yeah. In fact, when the boss is looking, maybe you're a very conscientious worker, but when the boss walks in, does not some sense of fear and trepidation oftentimes come on? Oh boy, got to make sure I'm doing well now. And we look at the whole question of external service of that as those who please men. Let's realize something. People pleasing, I know this is going to step on toes, it steps on my toe. But people pleasing involves self focused motives. It's about me. People pleasers are doing it for their own ego. And I know some people say, no, I don't. Well, according to the Scriptures, that sense of pride that we develop in, in things is always self-focused. I think we need to be oh so careful that we don't fall into the trap of shamming. Or on the other side of the spectrum, but yet same idea the idea of only doing enough to get by, to stay out of trouble by trying to remain on somebody else's good side. And this passage is saying, when it's external service, in order to please men, realize that problems set in. It's not healthy. It's not good. Somebody says, well, you're always supposed to please others. I don't deny that. But let's get God in the center of the focus. Let's realize that if I'm pleasing others to please myself or for the sake of things that are strictly earthly, that's not ever what God intended. 
I should want to bring honor and glory to Him by pleasing others. That should be my reasoning. And as we look at that, let's realize that my true character, who I am, shows the most when I'm alone. Or when I think no one else is looking. It's been said by so many different people that I can't give all the names to quote it. But my true character shows the brightest or the most expressively when I'm all by myself and nobody else is looking. And notice what he says, or what I say here at the bottom, this, this slide. But I must always remember that I can never present a false sense of reality in God's presence. I can never fool God. God sees all of it. He sees everything I do. He sees the whole aspect of my efforts, my ethics. So therefore, realize that there's a temptation to please men in a way that isn't healthy. Next thing we look at is the testimony of sincerity and submission. The testimony of having a sense of sincerity, a sense of submission that drives us. Notice the passage once again, obey, not with external service as those who please men, but rather with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, rather than for men. Realize that it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So as we dissect that a little bit, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Because it is the Lord Christ whom you serve, the Lord Jesus Christ whom you serve. Understand that fearing in that passage it refers to an attitude of reverence. An attitude of respect that recognizes the Lord's absolute authority and accountability in our lives. And I think that that is something that sometimes gets minimized. Too often gets minimized. And literally, that involves submitting to Him. Saying, okay, You are Lord. You are. And, and, and I don't think that's a subsequent decision after salvation. We are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Master Jesus Christ. And therefore, we recognize, who is it that saved me? He's my Lord. And as we define submission... We've done this recently. What is submission? It's an attitude of voluntary cooperation for the sake of maintaining order and doing what is right. That's what submission is. It's that voluntary cooperation for the sake of maintaining order and doing what's right. What's sincerity? The Greek term that's used there. It is an idea that is free from hypocrisy and selfishness. There's no hypocrisy. There's no phoniness. There's no mask. That's literally what the word hypocrisy means. Hypocrisy means that we're living under a mask. Hupo Christos. Chris, hupo Christos. Under a mask. So it's free from hypocrisy and selfishness. It's an attitude of honesty. An attitude of graciousness, an attitude, attitude of generosity and transparency. Nothing's hidden from you, God. You see it all. It's an attitude that says what you see is what you get. So as we look at the whole connection of submission and sincerity, let's realize that submission is intimately connected to sincerity. They, they go hand in hand. They're together together. And then looking at it the opposite way, sincerity towards submission, both sincerity and submission are related to pure and proper motives. What's your motive? What's your reasoning? Why are you doing it? As we consider the 
question of submission and sincerity, understand that our attitudes and our actions reflect our true character. I have worked with people on different jobs. When, when, I, when I worked, before I came here, I, I had stepped away from the church I pastored, and I worked at a rescue mission for a few years. And as I worked with different people there, I, I had a lot of folks in community service that were working for the court system. They were involuntary slaves. Literally what they were. And it showed. There'd be times when I'd have another guy with me going to pick up donations for the mission and I found myself doing all the work because the other person had no relationship with Christ and was saying, hey, I'm serving my time and that's all I'm going to give you is time. I'm not going to give you any work. And the attitude and the actions reflected true character there. And I think it's vital for us to see that it is essential, it's necessary that followers of Christ carry out our roles and responsibilities as a reflection of that relationship we have with our eternal Savior. I'm going to tell a story. I've met this guy one time. I really didn't know him, but he's a man that, that was at the seminary. He graduated from the seminary where I went before I was there. He was involved in a church ministry and determined that he needed to answer God's call to go to the mission field. So he's raising funds to go to the mission field, and yet he needed to provide for his wife and family. He had two children and try to provide, and he got a job with a construction company. His name was Todd. And Todd's working with this construction company, and they were working under com- seriously adverse conditions on a regular basis. And one day, the weather was bad, the working conditions were bad, and every worker on the job except for Todd walked off. And yet the boss had asked them, to move all kinds of building supplies from the bottom floor to the top floor of the building. Todd determined, that's what i got to do. And all day long, actually for overtime, he carried these supplies up. He thought nobody was watching. It didn't matter because he was going to do it for the right reasons. Well, Little did he know, but there was a general contractor who was on the job site throughout the day that he didn't see. He was so busy working. And the general contractor was so impressed that he had to know, what is it that drove you? What is it that you you were by yourself? Nobody was watching. You could have just punched the clock and said you were there. Todd said, I couldn't do that. Because that would be a dishonor to my Savior. And not only did Todd get commended for the job that he did, but he had opportunities to share his faith with many other people in the administration of the company. Because he was different. And I think it's vital that we realize there's a testimony to our submission and our sincerity. And it says here in this passage, whatever you do, no matter what it is, what you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that the Lord will receive the, from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Now let me just say, he's not talking about some special provision that he's going to make for us. He's talking about the reward of the inheritance of Jesus Christ that we receive because of our faith By grace, we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians talks repeatedly. Colossians mentions the inheritance that is awaiting for us in heaven. Did I work for that? Did I earn that? No. But it's promised. And in view of that promise, I work to honor my Savior. 
And we do our work heartily. What's that mean? It means with enthusiasm, with devotion, with dedication, and with drive. Do our work heartily. How many of us can be seen as doing our work that way? And and I'm not pointing fingers because I don't know. I just know when I look at that, I think to myself, I need to keep on keeping on. And as a follower of Christ, we'll summarize here with this. Follower of Christ, with the assistance and the aid of God's Holy Spirit, I should exhibit the best attitude and employ the best actions to enable me to be the best worker in whatever I do. All those things tie together. That's what I should be doing. I want to talk for just a couple moments. This is quick. About what I call the twist of slavery. The twist of slavery. Notice it says in that passage that it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And serve there strongly suggests a master-slave relationship. So let's tear it down first a little bit. I serve Christ. I've become a slave of Jesus Christ. Why am I a slave of Christ? Because He's my Savior, my Lord, my Master. I serve Christ. Formerly, used to be, I was a slave to sin. Now I'm a slave of Christ. But yet I'm still tempted to become a slave to my culture. I'm tempted to become a slave to my culture. So therefore, I should notice the ultimate reward of the inheritance. I've got heaven waiting for me. I'm saved by God's gracious provision. And I'm promised a future in glory. And therefore, as I describe this idea, I serve Christ It's important as well that I notice the consequence that it says of doing wrong. And I believe that consequence there says that, well, notice the word specifically, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done. And that without partiality. And in essence, he's saying no work, no pay. There's no benefit to shamming. Now, our world today, it's corrupt, it's twisted. Yes, there is. But as a slave of Christ, I serve Christ. And therefore, I ought not ever respect or not ever expect to receive pay for something that I didn't do. Plain and simple. And that leads us to the final thoughts. Just a couple thoughts here on what he says in chapter 4, verse 1. The turmoil of supervision. The struggle of being a supervisor. The turmoil of treating people the way you would want to be treated yourself. And yet, not not being a, a boss that lets things go. Notice the passage. It says, Masters, grant to your slaves, grant to your employees justice and fairness. He's knowing that you too have a master in heaven. What's the idea of justice and fairness there? It involves reflecting my faith in Christ. And that's regardless of the position that I hold. Reflecting my faith in Christ regardless of the position that I hold. And as we consider the whole concept of there's a turmoil, there's a tension I could have also used the word tension there. The tension of being a supervisor, being a good boss, it it means we need to know how to encourage those who you supervise. Encourage. Encouragement is vital. It's necessary. You need to know how to exhort them to do well. You need to hold the sense of accountability. People suggested some time back 
when I was searching for a new role, new ministry, they said, why don't you go teach at Moody Bible Institute? You've been teaching there as, a, as an adjunct faculty member. Why don't you just go to school and teach? And I said, you don't know me. Well, what do you mean I don't know you? I said, well, teaching in evening school, teaching people that are working full time, that's easy because I, I, I'm able to relate to them and understand their circumstances and everything else. But now teaching on campus, teaching students in this culture today, I, I, I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm not a teacher in that regard. And when they come to me with a late assignment, I'm too gracious. I'm too easy on them. I would have a very hard time of holding them down to that standard that they need to be held to. That's the challenge of being a supervisor. You need to be gracious enough, but not too gracious. You need to encourage, you need to exhort, you need to express a Christ-like attitude. And you need to honor the Lord in all that is done, everything. So what do we learn from this? What do we apply from this passage? What do we take home and say, okay, this is something I need to work on? Well, first off, understand that For each of us, my actions and my attitudes always speak louder than my words. My actions and my attitudes speak louder than my words. Well, I'm a Christian, but yet when my work habits don't appear very Christ-like, then there's a problem. And my work matters to God. God cares. God's concerned about my testimony 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ consistently, and therefore, everything I do is a reflection of that relationship I have with my Redeemer. That's a truth that all of us need to embrace and package into our lives in such a way that it affects us on Tuesday morning at 10.30. It affects us at 5 o'clock when the end of the workday is done on Thursday afternoon or on Friday afternoon. And understand that 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 sense of everything that we do is a reflection of that relationship I have with the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So finally, I'm always accountable to my Lord and Savior. I'm always accountable to Him. There's never a moment when that accountability is, well, we'll drop it this time. So, as we draw a close, let's just say this. For each one of us, I should live my life for the glory of God. And for the sake of the Gospel. Let's pray. Father, hmm. I I just want to simply say please. As we prayed earlier, meet us right here in this place right now and help us to work on the areas of our lives where the work needs to be done. And as I say that, I realize that there's, in a certain sense, a play on words in that statement. Work on us where the work needs to be done because our work matters to You. Whether we are working for some boss somewhere, some company somewhere, we look at the corporate structures and we think, oh boy, they're making so much money and they're paying me this? Well... God, help us to have the right attitude, the right perspective. Help us to see, as Paul saw years and years ago in the slave culture there, that, that with the wickedness and the, the, the abuse that went on, he still told slaves, in all things, obey those that are your masters. Help us in the areas where we volunteer. Help us in the areas where we are working in our homes 
Maybe no pay is involved. It's just merely a matter of upkeep, a matter of doing the things that need to be done. Help us. Help us to understand that we are accountable to you for everything. And if anyone here has never trusted in our Lord Christ, Father, I pray that they would understand in as clear of a fashion that not one of us is worthy of the salvation that is ours from what Christ accomplished. I know in a group this size that it's likely that there are those that haven't trusted Jesus. I don't point fingers or judge. I just say, God, please tap them on the shoulder in a spiritual way and, and, and help them to see that they simply place faith in Christ and they understand that He is now Master and Savior of their lives, giving them freedom from the penalty and the power and the problem of sin. Help them talk to somebody about it. And for the rest of us, strengthen us today. Guide us. Do a work, please. For Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen.